Great. Um, yeah. Hi. Thanks, um, Liz. Um, so yeah, my name is Adriana Foster. I'm been on various NASA above um, projects throughout my time <laughs> as a collaborator and a um, funded postdoc. And now I'm actually going to be taking on someone else's grant who's leaving. Um, but anyway, yeah, so thanks for having me. I most recently led this multi-disturbance synthesis. Um, this was a very, you know, definitely a group effort of, of a lot of different scientists. You'll see them all here. Um, and yeah, Liz just asked me to kind of talk about this. So this project arose as a synthesis working group within the NASA Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment. So during an above team meeting, I think in like 2019, um, a bunch of us in the vegetation dynamics working group, um, we got together in a breakout session to discuss Arctic and boreal disturbances. And, you know, we knew that that these disturbances are a dominant driver of ecosystem dynamics in the North American Arctic and boreal regions. They impact vegetation structure and composition, below ground conditions and biogeochemical cycling. And we also knew that many of these disturbances were predicted to intensify with climate change. So actually pictured here is the Kwekluk fire in Alaska, which was a large tundra fire that burned um, over 10,000 acres last year. However, in this breakout session, we sort of realized that, you know, while many of these disturbances within the region are well studied, like fire, um, there are many that are less well studied, such as those related to permafrost and those related to anthropogenic activities. And so our aim was to synthesize the major disturbances within the North American Arctic and boreal regions. We actually went back and forth a lot on whether we were going to do the whole pan-Arctic, pan-boreal, or just North America. And we, we settled on North America because it was a little more tractable. But um, specifically, we were summarizing each disturbance or disturbance type, um, focusing on temporal dynamics of vegetation loss and recovery, um, we also included these case studies of each topic or type where we investigated um, satellite derived trends of loss and recovery. And then we were also interested in looking at potentials for disturbance interactions, as well as the differing spatial and temporal characteristics of these disturbances. And so this work took quite a lot of time. We just published this last October, so it took about four years, I think, of though, you know, we kept reminding ourselves this was kind of all done in our free time. None of us was funded to do this work specifically. Um, but you can go check this paper out. It's kind of a monster. It's like, I think, like 40 pages or something like that. But it's, yeah, it's really great. It, it has a really great detail about um, all of these disturbance types. So yeah, we have this large range of disturbances that we investigated, um, including fire, uh, biotic disturbances, permafrost and hydrology related disturbances, um, anthropogenic. We also included weather, um, riverine processes, as well as um, mammalian herbivore activity. And so, as I mentioned, for many of these disturbance types, we looked at case studies um, investigating Landsat derived vegetation greenness and wetness before and following the disturbance to analyze um, the intensity, the time scale of the disturbance, and then potential recovery following that disturbance. And so these case study locations were derived from uh, either field locations from within our own group. Um, we also used the Alaskan and Canadian Forest Service aerial survey polygons, as well as some other polygon sources. And so here you can see a map of our case study locations. And so over each of these points and polygons, we extracted uh, Landsat 5, 7, and 8 pixels using Google Earth Engine, as well as this really great um, R package developed by um, Logan Berner, one of the uh, co-authors. And so I think this package is public now. It's really great. So you should go check it out. Um, but so for each of these individual field locations, we received, uh, we collected pixels within a 100 meter buffer. Um, around the point. And that was just because just to grab, try to grab as much information as possible in case that point maybe didn't occur exactly where um, the disturbance occurred. And then for each set of polygons, since we had so many, we collected a 25 pixel sample of 25 random polygons. And so this image here, you can see a small polygon and we extracted um, 30 meter Landsat pixels from a grid across that polygon and then 
randomly sampled those. And so all told, this ended up being about uh, 14,700 pixels at, again, 30 meters since Landsat, uh, spanning, each spanning 1984 to 2020. And so for each of these observations, we filtered out those with high cloud cover, um, snow, water, and radiometric and geometric errors. And then because we are collecting data across five Landsat 5, 7, and 8, we cross-calibrated the pixels across the three Landsat sensors um, using this random forest model. That's, this is all within this um, LSAT TSR package. So here you can see um, the Landsat data on the y-axis, um, which is used as the benchmark because it overlaps with both Landsat 5 and 8. And then for um, the Landsat 5 and 8 data on the x-axis. And then this is the raw data. And then the on the right is the calibrated data. And so then once we have these calibrated trajectories, we derived um, summer maximum values for NDVI and NDMI. And so here we can see a trajectory for NDVI for one pixel over time. And so we can clearly see something, you know, something has happened around 2005, 2006. However, for many of these pixels, especially those that we had derived from these large aerial survey polygons, not every pixel actually was, was over a disturbance, at least one that you could see in, in the imagery. And so we needed a way to filter out pixels that did not show any change. And so for that, we used um, the BFAST algorithm uh, to detect pixels with breakpoints around the time of a known disturbance. So this algorithm just functions by fitting trends and detecting breakpoints from those trends. So here we can see the time series, um, a fitted trend across the whole time series. And then below that, we see that the algorithm has detected this breakpoint around 2006. So for each of those pixels where a breakpoint was detected, um, we smoothed those original trajectories to derive kind of inflection points that were sort of um, not based just based on noise. And so we wanted an inflection point before the disturbance and then after the disturbance. And so um, we then normalized the vegetation index to this pre-disturbance mean that the, the pre-disturbance was determined by this inflection point. And so this was done uh, because we're comparing across many different disturbances and in many different regions of Alaska and Canada. So by normalizing it, so it's it's normalized NDVI. So it's like NDVI normalized to the to the mean before the disturbance. So then we're kind of looking at this relative effect of the disturbance on the vegetation index. So here are some trajectories for uh, spruce beetle and mountain pine beetle, which are aggressive bark beetles. This would be within our biotic disturbance types. So here we can see for mountain pine beetle on the bottom, you can see a drop in NDMI and, and oh, sorry, NDM, it's on the left, sorry, mountain pine beetle drop in NDVI and ENDMI, uh, especially for this green site. And so here you can see um, the mountain pine beetle, this is this green dot is where the site is located. And so this change um, corresponds to the characteristic shift from red uh, to uh, green to red needles in infested trees. So you can see these red needles here. However, for the spruce beetle, there's basically you know, no signal in NDVI, um, uh, which makes sense because the needles of infested spruce trees don't shift to red. However, we do see a decline in NDMI, which corresponds to uh, moisture stress brought on by that infestation. And then here are trajectories for lake drainage. So notice that the NDVI actually increases here due to the draining of the lake basin and colonization of new vegetation. And then the NDMI looks pretty noisy all over the place, but you know the average is, doesn't really change. Um, so this does not likely doesn't change because um, of the encroaching vegetation um, at these point locations are still inundated with water. So yeah, those are just a couple examples of the case studies that we looked at, but there are many more that you can go check out uh, in the paper. And so then we were also interested in looking at the different spatiotemporal characteristics of these disturbances. So notably, um, these disturbances were covering vary across spatial and temporal scale. So the spatial grain of individual disturbance events range from the order of meters for frost circles and seismic lines to you know, thousands of square kilometers for large boreal megafires. However, even for these small grained disturbances, their extent can be vast. So 
here are polygons of seismic lines for Alberta alone. It, it's basically, you know, it spans this huge region. And then additionally, although something like infest insect infestation occurs at the individual tree scale, um, seen here in high-res camera imagery, they can then spread to whole landscapes. So we developed several overarching spatiotemporal characteristics, um, spatial grain, which describes the average extent of an individual disturbance event, um, return interval, which describes the average length of time for disturbance to reoccur in the same location, um, occurrence timeline, which describes the average length of time it takes for the disturbance event to play out, and then recovery timeline, which describes the time it takes for the vegetation or ecosystem to return to pre-disturbance conditions, and then finally intensity and impact, which can be things like vegetation loss or vegetation decline in productivity. And so then we derive these categorical values for each of these metrics for all of our disturbances based on our own knowledge, um, as well as some feedback from subject matter experts. And so then we took those categorical values and applied them within a PCA to understand how the different metrics correlate with one another. And so this PCA kind of indicates the broad spread in the spatiotemporal characteristics associated with these disturbances. So it's interesting to note that the loadings for uh, frequency and intensity, as well as size and timeline are opposite one another, indicating a negative correlation. And then we can also see that some of these groups are clustered, um, like say the anthropogenic uh, disturbances in orange, whereas others span the range of the first two principal components like uh, permafrost in blue. And then as I said, we're also interested in uh, disturbance interactions. So uh, we developed these matrix uh, matrices that describe the potential interactions between all of our disturbances for the boreal zone on the left and the Arctic zone on the right. And so these were, um, we created these based on literature surveys and our own knowledge, as well as some uh, subject matter expert um, discussion. And so here the x-axis represents the driver. So this would be sort of the first disturbance that occurs. And then the y-axis is the potential response disturbance to that driving disturbance. And so red would correspond to an enhancing effect. So say here, drought stress has an enhancing effect on wildfire. Um, blue corresponds to a dampening effect. Um, beaver engineering has a dampening effect on wildfire. White corresponds to both either in time or space or kind of depending, it's kind of like a depends kind of thing. And so for example, uh, pests and pathogens have a kind of it depends effect on wildfire. And then gray, which is there's a lot of corresponds to either none or unknown. And so, you know, as you can see, we have many that can interact. We also have many that we kind of don't know the answer to. But just so, for example, wildfire can have an enhancing effect on cryogenic landslides. So rapid thaw following a fire um, can lead to the formation of an active layer detachment um, here. Biotic disturbances and drought can also interact. So drought can stress trees, leaving them vulnerable to defoliation, which can then make them more vulnerable to bark beetle infestation. And then uh, beaver dams trap water on the landscape, turning streams in, uh, into connected ponds. They widen riparian zones and alter groundwater flow. And so, you know, previously they were considered only a subarctic species, but recent observations show beaver colonization into low Arctic tundra regions of Alaska and Canada. And so increases in surface uh, and groundwater due to beaver dams can thaw the per permafrost uh, surrounding and beneath the beaver ponds. And these have the capacity to initiate and affect uh, things like lake formation and drainage, ice wedge degradation, cryogenic landslides and other thermocarst events. And then beavers have also been shown to prevent fire spread and provide fire refugia. So there are a lot of these really interesting disturbance interactions occurring across all of our groups. And we kind of just, this was sort of just scraping the surface of trying to get at um, you know, what these interactions are like at kind of a category qualitative level. And so I think the most striking thing here is how many unknowns there are in the gray. 
And so some of these are unknown because we don't have enough data and then some or because those disturbances don't currently overlap in space. So say like logging and um, uh, I don't know, <laughs> some like cryogenic uh, landslides maybe. Um, I don't think that's true, but yeah. So however, as we as disturbances increase in range, frequency and severity, we expect more of them to interact because more of them are going to be co-occurring. And so really we saw this as kind of a launching off point for future studies. And yeah, so to wrap up, um, most of these disturbances are predicted to increase in the future. And then these disturbances really function as hotspots of vegetation change against the backdrop of long-term climate change. And they have really important impacts on society. Um, they have the capacity to feed back to climate. And then as we found, there are these key unknowns about future trajectories and future interactions um, between the disturbances. Um, and yeah, with that, I would just like to thank the Multi-Disturbance Synthesis Working Group, which Liz was uh, a key member of. This was a, a really huge group effort. We could not have done it um, alone. <laughs> None of us could do it, have done it alone. And yeah, thank you very much. Happy to take any questions or start discussion. Thank you so much for presenting, Adriana. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. I wonder if anyone has questions specific for Adriana. And then once we go through questions kind of just about the work that she's presented, I'm we're going to have more of a broader discussion about the terrestrial ecosystem teams, and we might come back to some of the some of the work you presented too. But let's see. If there's just questions first about what you presented. Hi, Adriana. Great talk. That was really interesting. I've uh, haven't seen this paper yet, so I'm just kind of looking through it right now. I was curious. Right. Um, you know, how permafrost, I mean, I, you've obviously mentioned permafrost several times. And so I'm trying to look at um, some of these synthesis tables as to how it compares to a lot of these other disturbances. And um, I'm just confused how you, you know, define it or categorize it, especially in the, I guess you have a boreal region in here, uh, boreal versus Arctic, I believe. Oh, yeah, for, the, for the matrix, the, the interaction. Yeah, matrix. either the matrix tricks or just a straight one-way interaction um you know how does it how does it compare to a lot of other um disturbances in terms of um i guess it's it's plant growth feedbacks yeah there's a oh um i think we so we didn't that's an interesting or, question or i mean i, I mean you are respond you are looking at ndvi that's kind of what i mean oh right? yeah yeah sorry yes <laughs> um yeah, so we didn't really look at, um, so you're, you're saying like, how does it compare the permafrost disturbances compared to the other disturbances in the in the response time? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the main thrust of a lot of this, isn't it? It's um... Yeah, we, so we had like a graph that actually compared the like, um, the actual measured like NDVI and NDMI response time, but it was not, it was kind of mixed. From the, mm -hmm. from the from the study because I think there were th this case study was kind of we went back and forth um, between like having a really in-depth methods kind of like really robustly tested validated against data um, versus kind of you know this was a, a literature review so we kind of were mm -hmm. trying to keep it to a literature review and have these just be kind of small examples but um, I will say that that um, each individual, so the individual permafrost, oh, let me just reshare my just, uh, PowerPoint. <laughs> um, the, so all the categories, I'll say like some of these were like cryoturbation, for example, like that and, and ice wedge degradation, that isn't really a single Kind of event that happens like one time in a location like you might think of a, like a fire because mm -hmm. it's kind of a it's a seasonal thing that happens like every year whereas mm -hmm. cryogenic landslides yes that's like a very fast you know that can happen very quickly and has like can have like a long um recovery time and right. lake drainage is kind of the sometimes can be the opposite we found that there was one um study that a uh, case study where the lake drained like really slowly over time. And so it actually, it I wouldn't, we couldn't really compare say like permafrost 
versus wildfire because each of these individual permafrost disturbances that we looked at was pretty unique. Um, I'll say right. that the, the PCA that we we kind of, this was just based off of our own kind of knowledge. You'll see that like this permafrost kind of spans this whole like, uh, prince, you know, the first two principal components because we've got cryoturbation that has like it's um, the extent is large. Can you, can you just to just to pause you for a Sorry. second? Focus, <laughs> that's fine. Focus on this PCA graph. What are you yeah. what, what are you trying to get across in the PCA graph? Um, yeah, I, mean, I think there, it, there's a lot there, obviously. So. There is a lot. Yeah. So I think it, it's mostly showing, you know, how these spatiotemporal characteristics differ between each of the disturbances and that it's it's really not, you know, I think one of the things that we kind of concluded from it was that we need we need stat, we need measurements that kind of span both like really small <laughs> um small spatial scale. So like on the order of couple meters, but then the extent should be vast, which is, you know, hard to pull off. And then in a, from like a modeling perspective, um, we needed to consider this spatial and temporal scale if we're going to be adding any of these disturbances to uh, like a, pro a process-based modeling framework. All right. So this is a PCA of the spatial and temporal scale of everything that's in the literature. Yeah, so we kind of took these categories, we gave each disturbance a val like a qualitative value, we turned that into a like a numeric scale and then put that into a PCA. Mm -hmm. We even had a workshop where we invited yeah. additional members of the community outside of just those of us who were co-authors and yeah. we, we gathered input from all from community members too to try to make our analysis even more robust, make sure we had, uh, you know, as many sources as we could and as much information as we could. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions about the research? All right. Well, I am gonna transition. Thank you, Adriana. Let's give her all another yeah. round of applause. Sure. Uh, I want to transition us into thinking a little bit about the, the reason that we we had Adriana come here right at the beginning of the year is our team has and IARPIC really has gone through a change as we've had a new Arctic research plan come out. And um, we wanted to think about, let's see if I can, I think it's this one I want to share. All right, do you see? Oh, this is the end. Don't look yet. Oh no, there we go. We're not sharing anything. So. So we're not seeing the slides yet. You're not seeing the slides. Oh, okay, great. Well, that's good then. I wasn't ready for you to. Okay. Um, so do you see slides now? Okay. So the uh, the Arctic Research Plan came out at the end of last year, I think November of 2022. And uh, IERPIC, it kind of redefines some of what its goals are and what its trajectory is through the Arctic Research Plan and then in this what they call the Biennial Implementation Plan, the, the BIP. And so the Biennial Implementation Plan goes into uh, kind of how, get this out of the way there, kind of um, how research, what, what research will contribute to the Arctic Research Plan over, over a two-year time frame. So there's uh, I think the research plan itself is it's like five years or so, and um, the biennial implementation plan is like two years. So there are what's called research goals and deliverables, and this really spans all 18 agencies and groups that make up IARPIC. And um, the idea is that different agents, IARPIC overall is kind of really geared towards helping to encourage collaboration and communication across different art, uh, agencies that are all contributing to Arctic research, as we know. And so these different goals and deliverables are all aimed at understanding changes in the Arctic. And um, what we've done, what Elizabeth and I have done is with our team, we've tried to focus in on some goals and deliverables we feel that might make the most uh, impact with our team. Um, so let's see, I want to just Kind of, we're going to review some relevant deliverables and then think about future activities that our team could participate in. 
uh, that might help us as we move forward. Uh, let's see here. So in the biennial implementation plan that we now have, we have these goals and objectives are in the center of, of kind of this sphere of, of understanding of IARPIC. And then we have both collaboration teams and communities of practice that occur around it. And so the collaboration teams um, are like the, now there's priority area teams, so they're called PAs. So Arctic System Science is one that's um, really relevant to, I think, our team. And so now the terrestrial ecosystems community of practice helps to support the, the different uh, priority area collaboration teams. So there's a kind of been a, a restructuring. So we're now a community of practice. Um, and then within that, there's the integration group that tries to bring all of this information together and share it with the principals and the staff group for IARPIC Excel, which is uh, reporting, I guess, to Emeritus, is it to the, to the White House or how did, what's, yep. there? Yeah, we report to um, a uh, appointed um, person from each agency uh, that is an IARPIC agency, and then as well um, to the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Okay. Thanks. So the way this is now organized, we have the priority area collaboration teams, the foundation activity collaboration teams, and then a number of communities of practice. So there are these four priority area teams and uh, any of the communities of practice could kind of uh, be helping to provide a knowledge base to the different priority area teams. I think our team in particular is very uh, related to Arctic Systems interactions. We have a lot of deliverables that match up with what Arctic Systems uh, are about. But we also um, found some overlap with I think risk management and um, you know, you, you can find overlap with any of these teams really. Um, and then there are what's called foundational activities and collaboration teams. And so these are activities that all of us in our IARPIC are trying to address. So things like having uh, fair data management. So thinking about fair and care principles when we do our data management work or education capacity building. So there are different teams that are focused on each of these aspects of the Arctic Research Plan, but it's uh, information that we can all be incorporating into our teams. And then of course, so we're hearing in communities of practice organized alphabetically, not by importance of course, <laughs> um, but uh, that's kind of how the, the new, the, the organization flows now. So Elizabeth Powers and I are the two co-leads for this team. We've gone through and tried to pick out some priority deliverables that we feel that our team could make progress on over the next year. And we are still thinking about how our team could do this. Traditionally, what's happened is that the, these teams have had um, kind of monthly webinar series where maybe there's some dialogue from folks from different agencies and we can you know, add this meeting as a as meeting one of the deliverables. But we've also started to think about, can our team do something more, something different? Is there perhaps a tool that, that we could help to develop or a white paper that could identify gaps in Arctic research, in terrestrial ecosystems, Arctic research that we could kind of uh, help the community more, move forward in a different way. And so we've identified some of the deliverables that are in the biennial implementation plan where our team is called out. And we want to think about as a community, are there ways we could kind of move any of these goals forward? Um, so these are some of the different goals. They're, they just have different number labels, but looking at synthesizing research and monitoring on, monitoring on Arctic ecosystem processes, uh, understanding where natural and human made threats and hazards pose a risk to the Arctic. Um, and you can see the different agencies that the biennial implementation plan has listed as partner agencies for each of these. It doesn't mean those are the only agencies. It just means these are agencies that have self-identified that they believe they have activities already ongoing that are part of this goal. We've, we just listed a, a few, I think we have 
five or six deliverables total. So this next one is integrating information from field, laboratory and remote sensing studies to examine and quantify relationships among surface topography, vegetation composition, hydrology and disturbance effects. Uh, and then we have thinking about terrestrial and subsea permafrost degradation and thinking about essential uh, variables that are needed for maps of, of Alaska and the circumpolar Arctic. So as a community, we wanna think about how do we make progress on these objectives and deliverables? Do we continue having hybrid meetings with presentations followed by uh, maybe working group activities? Do we wanna have some kind of smaller working group focused on developing a white paper or a publication or some type of tool or product? And uh, are there new collaborative science initiatives that we should be thinking about as a group or making group members aware of? And I have a jam board for this, which let me see if I can pull it up and share it. Let's and um, Liz, while you're doing that, I do want to point out that Tom Douglas is here and he is a lead for PA4, the um, risk and hazard PA. And so um, if, yeah, just making that connection. Yeah, thank you, Tom. You want to say a word or two while we're while I'm still getting set up, anyways. Oh wait a second, my thing just said Zoom quick. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh yeah, we can hear you and see you still. Okay, I'm getting all these pop ups that's quitting, so I may disappear. But oh, no. uh, yeah, so PA four is is focused on risk mitigation and and sort of hazards and whatnot, and I think it, you know if I guess if you if you thumb through the various. Uh, Sort of projects and whatnot that we identified. Um, some of them are things like scaring together best practices for infrastructure design and siting. Um, others are things like, and this is a big one, but trying to identify the variety of potential sort of disturbances or risks across, you know, the state of Alaska. So that would be fire, earthquake, you know, permafrost thaw, coastal erosion, river erosion. Um, air quality has come up, volcanoes. You can just kind of imagine the, the massive list. Um, making the list is fun and easy. And then you sort of throw out, what about compounding disturbances? So let's say there's a wildfire somewhere where the runway is undergoing you know, maintenance because of thawing permafrost or bad infrastructure or whatever. So I, it, it's fun to talk about. I think it's a pretty big topic and it's not clear to me um, you know, how, how far we can get on it, but we're doing our best and people like Meredith are holding us to the fire. So, so yeah, we'll do what we can, but anyway, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, that's, that's one of the reasons we wanted to have Adriana come and present because when we look back at that disturbance matrix, we really see that there are these different um, variables that are interacting in different ways. And there's, there were a lot of gray areas. We'll have to pull up that disturbance matrix again. And there's a lot of gray areas where there's, there are unknowns or where, we don't, you know, we really just don't understand the the relationship between the the, the drivers there, and so um, you know, and then as climate is changing, we're going to see additional changes. So something that we want to be thinking about within our team. Um, so we have this Jamboard, and um, there's not so many of us, so people can just call things out, or if you can, if you want to put ideas on the Jamboard, I just have three little slides here thinking about. What are some ways that we can maybe make progress in our team on thinking about some of these different deliverables that we have, thinking about Arctic system processes, um, natural and, and human-made threats and hazards? I think that's the tie-in to your team, Tom. I think that's right. Isn't that one of your deliverables, I think? Uh, and then we have things like laboratory and remote sensing studies. You know, this, I think, above falls into this, the Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment. And um, and then this last one is uh, updating essential variable maps. We, we're trying to collaborate more with the permafrost team as well, but I think their, their, uh, their leads were on travel this week. But um, thinking about, they're thinking about maybe making some maps of uh, permafrost and ground ice content across the domain, maybe updating some of those maps. And that might be a deliverable that their team chooses to take on. Um, 
Oh, and Adrian saying there was a table of needs and unknowns in, in the paper. And I think that's a good point there. And I'm sure there are other lists out there too that could, even that could be maybe a product that our team takes on is just identifying the gaps. Um, and our next, our next meeting, I think we'll be, we'll be doing a little bit more of that as well. We're gonna have the NASA above uh, science lead, Scott Getz is gonna come and talk about some of the Arctic research that our, that above has undertaken in the last uh, two phases, the last seven years or so, and kind of think about what our next phase is there. And then uh, also we're gonna hear from the Alaska Fire Science Consortium. They're going to talk a little bit about some of the the needs that they have uh, as in their in their team. So it's we're going to hear from different groups as to what what they're needing, or uh, where where are their unknowns or where are their gaps. So then we can think collectively as a group maybe where we might want to go forward. Yeah, I'm li I'm liking the chat too, thinking about volcanoes and not necessarily near frozen ground, but still could have an impact. I know when I've done field work out in Alaska, sometimes uh, we would we would maybe find a like an ash layer in the soil. So it's definitely can have far reaching effects. So no, are there any thoughts? You know, we have, it's difficult with these webinars because we get, we don't always get the same members of our team attending. You know, this, I think we have over a hundred folks that are signed up to be a part of the terrestrial ecosystems collaboration or community of practice. And so you, you get some people who come when they're they're able, um, but I think as a group, we could think about, you know, are there team members that wanna play a more active role or uh, take on some of this collaboration or think about different ways that Elizabeth and I can kind of work together. Oh, Adriana, yeah, your hand is up. Yeah, I, I guess on another thing that we kind of talked a lot about in the paper, this is like a need was um, the anthropogenic like data, like deep data sources and, and like records on anthropogenic disturbances. So oil and gas exploration, oil and gas wells, and then logging kind of a lot of those databases are kind of scattered and, and it's hard to come by. At least I guess it depends on maybe US versus Canada, but I think that was like a big thing that that we that was in our need data needs was like we need to be able to have all this these records like easily <laughs> discoverable. Um, yeah. so we can do research on them and yeah, but there's like a lot of issues with that too. Like not like I don't know. Yeah, some of it is like bureaucratic. <laughs> recently, right? Didn't, was it uh, Mary Kang has one? Yeah, Mary Kang, but like I think it took like a huge effort for her to do that. So, yeah, so Alaska, yeah, I think, yeah, the Alaska maybe has it those records available, but I think maybe the can Canadian one is harder to come by. But I don't know. Oh, and Erin, I see um, your chat. Alaska Geospatial Council should have those maps. I guess you're talking about the. Maybe this last one, yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's the council that Leslie Jones runs. That's the state. Oh, yeah. I think I yeah, said. I don't know what the geospatial consortium is. If that's something else, but yeah, that's like Elizabeth, a federal state collaborative oh, group. Yeah, Elizabeth Powers is who is our other co lead. She's a part of the Alaska Geospatial Council. Uh, she's USGS, and she's going to give us a talk in the fall to talk. They're doing a, a vegetation um, map and trying to kind of have it cover all of Alaska and be on a kind of a consistent time step. And so she's gonna talk a little bit more about that because I think that's a really important effort. And uh, you know, what what I really like about what, her, what that group has done, the Alaska Geospatial Council is they've identified this need that is across different agencies. And they've spent a lot of time as a group thinking about how can we take this need and and provide something to the community and try to get buy-in by different agencies and different groups. And so they're really trying to get other agencies to kind of buy in to help fund this map, which is would be really cool. So I'm glad you brought that up. Cool. Um, I think above kind of goes in here. Um, 
And so we'll have Scott Getz present on that. Um, put that on here, looking at all the different relationships. And there are, the, are there any groups you think that we should be reaching out to for future seminars to, uh, or any projects that you're personally involved in or you know someone who's involved in that would help us to kind of make progress on some of these deliverables or thinking about some of these different issues? It may or may not be helpful, but you know, NASA Snow X just happened and, and those oh, folks yeah. are all over permafrost. I, my sense is they and above are not as linked as maybe someone like me would scream and yell that they should be. And, and Liz, you might know more about this, but um, they they were just here. I think it's mostly a done deal. There, there's a bit of people coming back in April to look at albedo, and there's a, a kind of an October sort of wrap up. Um, I think we at Krell and, and probably some other subsets of the of the Snow X folks are going to try to keep the measure some of the measurements going March a year from now, and then the following fall, but. Um, sort of unclear. Anyway, they it'd be neat to get them more involved in all these types of things. Um, I think sometimes the snow people just sort of, well, let's see, my knock on ecologists is they all show up in June and they leave in August, no offense, um, and they think everything's green. And my snock on my snock on snow people is they come in March when we've got this gorgeous sun and the aurora's mm -hmm. out and ice sculptures, and they just assume everything's white. So um, getting those two groups to maybe talk a little more um, and of course, Mark, all those microbes are doing their thing during both seasons. But yeah, that if that I just that's a dream, I guess. And then I'll I, my last sort of side rant, of course, is shoulder seasons, which everyone just completely mm -hmm. ignores um, and are probably the most critical time of everything. But enough from me. Thank you. Well, I'll also add to that because I pinged this in the chat that there's a lot of folks who live here who are doing this work in collaboration with state and federal agencies. And I'm kind of struck by the fact that. I don't see anyone else from Alaska on this call. So I would encourage you guys to also think about outreach and working with folks either in the university system or, I mean, there's tons of folks doing all kinds of relevant research in state yeah, and federal agencies too. That's a great idea, Erin. And we're always looking for uh, more speakers to reach out to. So if you think there's someone, you know, we should, uh, we should think about. Um, that's, that's always really helpful. Yeah, Adrienne, I see you put in Brendan Rogers. Uh, they have that permafrost, he has that permafrost pathways project that's funded. Is that the one you're thinking about, Adrian? He gave a yeah. talk to the permafrost team. Oh, okay. Last year, and uh, we encouraged members to attend that one. We could link back to it. I hate to get people to do more than one. Sure, yeah. The terrestrial team and the permafrost team are so closely tied, it's it's tough. We're going to have Logan Berner give it. well, the permafrost team is uh, having Logan Berner give a talk in a few months and we're going to join in and listen in on that talk. So, uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's tough. So Liz, a couple of random comments. And I think yeah. what you just said is perfect to get folks to come to these. One thought might be to find ways to combine sort of topics. So for instance, yeah. um, if you had something like this, but then sort of, and also hydrology or also infrastructure or something like that, you could perhaps broaden. I think something might be look at this and say, Oh, it's an ecosystem permafrost thing. I don't totally do that. So, and then you can sort of help scare up the different, you know, sort of the union of sets of groups and then sort of break. Another thing would be um, Tor Jorgensen. I, I think this is just like his, his sort of passion play, but he's trying to update sort of the permafrost map for the state of Alaska. And he's doing a really cool job. He's being very methodical about it. I think it's like a hobby project, so it's not funded. It, it has taken him a while. I mean, he's doing it in sections. And I think... He's done most, I think he's done all the way to kind of like almost the Yukon River. I think he's mm -hmm. done most of Southern and Southeast Alaska. And I think basically the boreal sort of the interior is what remains. Um, a, you might want him to present if, if that made sense, maybe what, how he's doing this. Um, he gave a nice AGU talk on that, that sort of Friday late afternoon session. Um, he's always just amazing if you can get him, you know, he's Sort of He's retired and, and crazy yeah. busy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can try to squeeze him if you want. Um, I could try to help anyway. But yeah, if you can get him, that'd be great. I know he's about to head off on a big, like three week snowmobile trip. So he's gone for a while, but maybe earlier in the summer or late spring. Um, he's just a wonderful resource um, if you can get him. Yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful. And Tom, is your team, do you have some, any upcoming meetings that we should 
you know, think about inviting our members to attend or are there any? PA4, I don't know. I mean, I think Meredith will realize we, we're we kind of having a hard time getting the three of us to sort of be good communicators and that that's sort of an us problem. But um, hopefully uh, Meredith can help kick us in the rear correctly and get us moving. But I, I don't know. We had hoped to have kind of monthly meetings um, and start that kind of in February, but I don't even know that we've had one. And so um, just a side thing, but. Yeah, yeah, I think, oh, sorry, Liz. Um, just going to note that the new collaboration teams are getting off the ground. It's taking, you know, it just takes a little while. Yeah, yeah I would say though, Meredith, I, I, I'm a little bit, I guess I'm the only one for PA4 here, but I, I think we could and should be doing more, but it, I don't know the best way to do that, but you and I can worry about that offline. Probably more information than your group needs, Liz, but we're trying. No, it's it's good. It's it's helpful discussion. And um, Aaron, thanks for the tip about Amy Larson. I think that's a really good idea. Um, what else was I going? With? Yeah, a last, uh, you know, last potentially interesting topic, Liz. Uh, sort of farming and agriculture is a neat aspect of land use that's really increasing in sort of study and interest up here. And I feel like your group probably, I don't want to sound like a competition, but um, more than others uh, could speak to that. And there are some sort of human dimensions, um, sort of economics. Uh, Meredith, you could help me on the names of the other PAs, but a, a couple of them, you might be able to get them and some of their groups involved, if you think in terms of just sort of, yeah, sort of changing land use um, and increasing interest on that. Okay, yeah, that's a good idea too for, for more topics. We had thought about as a group taking a, a pause during the summer months when a lot of people are out on field work. What do you think about as a team? I mean, would do you think team members, would, would they want to do one more Zoom meeting in the middle of the summer or is it does it make sense to kind of pause as a team? Does anybody have any? Would you personally attend a summer meeting? You know, it's kind of the, it's hard to get people in the summer. I try not to lose to momentum. To field, <laughs> I'll be here. You'll be here. I never get to go to the field anymore. You never get to go to the field. Yeah, maybe we should plan some more for the summer then too. That might be a good idea. Try not to lose momentum. I think that's key. Um, yeah. Even, even if four people show up, I think it's still powerful. Yeah. That's true. Right. Make sure people aren't forgetting about it. I'll just add one more thing. I'm not ex totally sure what um, how making if this it helps in making progress on deliverables, but our permafrost microbiology with Jeff, which definitely uh, we have a, a a very active permafrost microbiology group, which probably overlaps quite a bit with just Arctic and boreal soil microbiology as well, and. Um, you know, we're we're quite a um, an active, coordinated group. Uh, you know, putting out we just put out one perspectives paper, and now we're doing a big like literature review paper, and then soon we're going to be doing a a methods paper for Arctic work and sort of Arctic soils and microbes and maybe some biogeo stuff. Um, we're just in the initial stages of talking talking about how we'd organize that, but. Um, Anyhow, you know, I can, you know, there, there's a big community out there of, of soil microbial people, and they're not always um, very connected to um, veg or ecology mm -hmm. uh, people. And so, um, you know, I can also help to kind of interface this group with that group as well and, and maybe bring more of the soil microbiology to to questions you all might be interested in. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. I, I'm seeing a lot of good ideas for other talks we could do, or maybe talks we could combine on the same day. So, you know, we have maybe two talks, like one that's more traditional terrestrial, but then one that pulls in the microbiome piece or- Or at least be, I could uh, make, be reaching out to them to make sure that they know about this group. Um, because I don't think there's an IARPIC, you know, no, I was just, there's not I an IARPIC just, microbiology, you know. No, I was looking back. Can you see when I switched back to the slideshow, does that show up for you guys? I don't know what you do. You see like the community organization now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I was trying to think of where that even this there, is. There is a now there is a cold, high anaerobic digestion team 
So maybe not exactly relevant. Um, That's but. interesting. Is that related to uh, working with like uh, working with um, municipalities or something? Here know? is their like statement um, of work. Here is uh, I'll drop a link to the the group. I don't work directly with that team, so I'm not sure exactly who they're connected with. I see Anne's question. Do you uh, want studies about tundra engineering for coastal barriers to surge and flooding? Anybody else studying this would want to connect, can have community monitors to present. That includes youth. I like the idea of uh, kind of adding community, the community science piece. And uh, I think it, there might be a coastal team. Is there a coastal team? Yeah, coastal resilience has a team, but it might be something to combine with their team to think about too. So that's a really good idea. Um, all right, well, this is really helpful. It's great to have kind of a smaller group discussion. Uh, let me pull back up here. Okay, um, we're kind of nearing the end of our time here, so I want to make sure we stay on stay on time. Um, just for the end here, I just want to remind folks our next meeting. We're going to try to meet every third Thursday of the month. It, it isn't always that. I think this this month, I think we might be like the we had a fourth, yeah, we're the fourth Thursday, but that's because there's a lot of days in March. But um, we're going to try to normally meet the third Thursday of every month. We'll hear from Scott Getz and from Randy Jan and Allison York from the Alaska Fire Science Consortium. And then we'll think a little bit more about planning future activities. Uh, but we spent a lot of time doing that today. So thank you for that. And then, uh, and thanks, Mark. And thanks to Gunnar Ron. And also, we're actually seeking applications for additional co leads for our team. So, you know, the, some of the other teams have three and four co leads, and you don't have to be in a federal agency. You can be a non federal co lead as well. And if this is something that you're interested in, or you know somebody else who might be interested in this, this is great for early career researchers who are thinking about ways that they can build up um, collaborations and meet. Uh, meet folks from different agencies or different groups that are doing research in the Arctic. You know, think about whether this might be something that works for you and you can send, uh, you can email er Meredith. We've, we have a set of closing date of the 25th, but we would be more than happy to, uh, to hear your statement, your brief statement. So thank you for your time today. And uh, I wanna thank Adriana again for presenting and we hope to see everyone next time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.